don't waste all your time just worrying about building your base. At some point, you got to try hard. At some point, you need to stop being so tired from doing all the base building and spend that energy trying harder things. Hey y'all, I'm Ryan Devlin and welcome to the Struggle Climbing Show, where I usually talk with elite climbers about their struggles and breakthroughs in training, nutrition, tactics, and mental game. But today, I'll be chatting with an expert coach as we look back on season one through the lens of training. I'm really psyched for this, you guys, because these, these next four episodes here with these experts are really like the capstone of the season. They're going to allow us to look back and find patterns, common themes, things that we can take away as regular average climbers from what the pros have struggled and learned in their own careers. And here to help us decode the pros' secrets is Dr. Tyler Nelson from Camp 4 Human Performance. I think y'all know Tyler's name. He's been bringing cutting-edge science to the world of training for climbing, and in the process, he's blowing up myths of training that we've long thought to be true. And he's helping climbers from pros like Alex Johnson to everyday climbers like you and me identify exactly what types of training will take their climbing performance to new heights. In graduate school, Tyler completed a dual doctorate slash master's degree in exercise science with an emphasis on tendon loading and rehabilitation. He's also a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the NSCA, and he teaches conferences worldwide on a host of topics. I am so psyched to look back at season one through Tyler's eyes. Get ready to be schooled. The official climbing nutrition sponsor of The Struggle is Fizzy Vantage. Y'all, I'm a huge fan of this company because their science-backed products just work. And our guest today, Dr. Tyler Nelson, also uses and loves Fizzy Vantage. And this guy's a lot smarter than I am. One of our favorites is Supercharged Collagen, which is used daily by more than 50 pros, from Daniel Woods and Paige Clausen to Jonathan Seacrest and Natalia Grossman. I think you've probably heard of those people, as well as thousands of regular climbers like you and me. It's easy. You know, you just add it to your morning caffeine or shake it up before a workout, and you'll be taking care of those tendons so that you can level up your climbing and performance. I love this stuff. You can get yourself some Fizzy Vantage in Europe on the Epic TV shop and in the States at various gyms or at fizzyvantage.com. Hit that link in your show notes or use checkout code STRUGGLE15 to save 15% off your order at fizzyvantage.com. Check it out. I think you're going to love it. The Struggle is also supported by patrons of the show, which is just so awesome. Man, do I love the climbing community. Thank you guys so much for listening and supporting if you can. Look, I know you probably have like a million subscriptions already. So do I. But if you have room for one more, I would love, love, love your support. We got some really cool patron perks in the hopper. And this show just wouldn't be possible without your support. So swing on over to patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show to check it all out. Thanks so much. And lastly, I'm really proud to say that the struggle is carbon neutral thanks to a partnership with the Honold Foundation, whose mission is to promote solar energy for a more equitable world. Y'all pop over to honoldfoundation.org, and if you can, consider setting up a monthly donation like I did and learn about the awesome projects they're supporting. They're just doing amazing work, and your tax-deductible donations are what make it possible. So check it out and get involved if you can. All right, get ready to apply maximum stimulus to your brain tendons with this interview with Dr. Tyler Nelson. Dr. Tyler Nelson, welcome to the Struggle Climbing Show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm just so psyched to dive into all of this with you, Tyler. I've been following your content for a long time now. You put out great stuff on Instagram and have on a lot of different podcast interviews. And um, you've really kind of blown the lid off of what we thought was settled science with regard to training and injuries and that kind of thing. And so before we dive into specifics, I'd just like to hear what drew you to this profession. What drew you to working with climbers yeah well i think it's just out of the passion for climbing just like you know why climbers do what they do um and i think it's pretty good to understand that science is never settled right it's always trying to disprove yourself continuously which is kind of like you know how your whole struggle question that you asked everyone is kind of about too is you know understanding that we got to keep working at it and we got to keep learning. And so it's like this constant struggle to keep 
you know, digesting information and learning new things and understanding what we don't know. And so that's kind of what's always driven me. And so mostly just had a passion, just loved rock climbing and saw that there was a gap maybe there. Well, we in the community are really um, fortunate that you have chosen this as your passion and your profession because you've made so much great content available. So I'm really excited to dive in to look back on these 10 elite climbers through a lens of training. But before we do, I want to zoom out and hear from you about struggle. What's your relationship to struggle with regard to rock climbing? Uh, I'm, I'm always, I've always been familiar with struggling just because I grew up playing sports, you know, and I was um, a pretty competent wrestler when I was a kid, specifically like a Greco-Roman wrestler. And, you know, it's always intimidating in that setting to actually see your opponent, right? And your opponent's another like living, breathing creature. And you're like, that kid looks tough. And so it's always like that competitiveness, right? Like I've, I'm just very familiar with that. Um, but when I was out of college, I was kind of lost at what to do because the team sport thing was no longer a part of my life. So I had to develop, you know, this, I've had this new passion for rock climbing. And so as a consequence of falling in love with that, for me, the initial struggle with climbing was, I guess, maybe learning what you need to spend time working on, not rely on your strength so much. Where for me, literally it was my strength was, is my biggest limiter is you can be overly strong where you rely on your strength too much which disallows you to spend as much attention on technical skills. And so for me, my biggest struggle as a climber for sure was learning to dial that back a little bit and not put so much emphasis on that, which is kind of hard to do. And most of the, you know, participants that you had on this podcast already, you know, it's like catering to your strengths is fun, you know, and it makes you feel good about yourself. So it's it's a bit challenging to, to learn that. Yeah, and I think we're all still... Um working through that uh, and at, you know, one level or another, even even the pros, um, you know, I think have struggled with that. And let's now take a look at some of these pros here. Um, 10 elite climbers across all kinds of disciplines, from boulderers to comp, big walls, uh, sport. Let's take a look at their struggles through the lens of training. What were some big takeaways first before we get um, into some case studies? What were your big impressions from the season as a whole? One of the initial ones is that everyone had to learn the hard way, which is mm. kind of like I did as well, you know, uh, with climbing. And so it's all of these kind of age, I guess, related understandings of needing to rest more, needing to do less, like the training is secondary to the climbing. All of that stuff comes from most of your participants. I'm not sure about the age of everyone, but maybe Jordan is one of the younger ones. Mm -hmm. But most of them have had a like a pretty strong climbing career and a pretty big, long kind of journey of understanding, you know, that doing more is not the answer. And I think that's a, a big thing that we see that's really can't be emphasized enough where I think it's the episode with Alex, or maybe it was with uh, Kevin, who said, I got a fingerboard and then I got rest two days afterwards. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's really hard to teach athletes to do less, knowing that they're going to get more out of it. Yeah, that's, that is interesting, you know, about learning the hard way, because you would think elite climbers, you know, they have so many resources around them. And just all of us as climbers now have so many resources. But for some reason, um, we do tend to learn the hard way, especially with regard to training or overtraining. And I feel like, you know, one of the patterns that was clear in the training chapter here with these elite climbers is like a full half of them said that um, training itself was the struggle. In effect, not knowing how to train properly or even training at all. They would just train by climbing a lot. And so, you know, from, from your lens, from your perspective, is that still something that's very common? Or are we now moving in a direction where climbers are far more receptive and knowledgeable with regard to just the concept of training for climbing in general? I think now the concept of training is maybe not foreign, but I think... Still, the assumption that we need to do a lot of training is 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 there. But the other thing that I talk a lot about is, you know, the the training interventions that people use, they don't really have the same influence on people that are different. And so, 
you know, really kind of identifying what an individual athlete needs in terms of their training is a bit nuanced. And that's where the testing and things become really interesting because this idea that everyone needs to do finger maximum hangs, campus boarding, you know, four by fours, just as a couple examples, you know, that's not necessarily true. And it's really easy to point that out and identify that with really good testing because athletes are just different. They've had a different training background. They have different biomechanics. You know, all of those things influence performance. Um, so I think that's, you know, quite interesting as well. Yeah, good. Well, it's good to know that um, not only are the pros struggling with similar things that the rest of us are, but there's some really great science that can help point us now in the right direction on training smarter, not harder. So let's get specific. And I think Alex Johnson's a perfect example to take a look at here because you've worked with Alex, of course. And Alex brought up a really interesting notion here that, you know, the assumption is that she's got these crazy strong fingers. And of course she does, you know, certainly compared to me and, and most other climbers, but she might not necessarily agree with that assumption. Let's take a listen to what she had to say in our interview. Compared to most other strong professional female climbers, my hands are on the weak side, like relatively weak, but I can activate in like two tenths of a second or something. So it's, it's contact strength. Like I have really fast activation. So I can't like sitting and just pulling my fingers aren't that strong, but I can like grab a hold really fast. So she's really discerning speed versus strength there. And, and you've worked directly with AJ, um, right? Going back. Yeah, so I, I know her from her from the coach that works with me now, Gabe, who was her technical kind of tactical skills coach for years. For her, in in that particular case, the example is, you know, you know, there's a difference between the strength of your fingers and the contact strength of your fingers, and it really has to do with the timing. And so, for her, like she mentioned, she has a pretty high rate of force development, and so because of that, she has probably more predisposition of gassing out quickly because she's using a high percentage of her force every time she grabs onto a hold very quickly. So in order to build more tolerance for traveling a further distance, giving more hard efforts, maybe in a competition, there's obviously a lot more volume of try hard. She probably needs to increase her maximum strength number so that high rate number goes down a little bit. Okay, so let me try to dumb that down for me. Uh, <laughs> and so, I mean, basically what you're talking about here is that um, the speed at which you can grab a hold might be more important than the maximum amount of pull force that you can push down on that hold if, in fact, it's slower. But in AJ's case, she already has a lot of that speed. So in her case, you're saying training up that overall strength might then be a benefit it would it would help to complement the speed that she has yeah yeah the the strongest athlete is not the best athlete that doesn't mean that being strong is not helpful or a good idea it simply means that that's not the same rate of force that you need for a sport so for her she can get away from not being so strong because she has a high rate and she's pretty tall so she has good distance to travel right she doesn't have to be as like, you know, strong in some instances and other athletes says she can be efficient. Yeah, it's, it's just far more nuanced than maybe a lot of us would think. You know, we just are constantly barraged with like fingerboard, fingerboard, strong fingers, but you're really separating this out. There's um, power, fast fingers, strong fingers at speed, and then there's strength, just overall strong fingers. And I think AJ was saying, you know, in, in her interview, she kind of contrasted herself with her friend Allison Vest, whom we know to be one of the most incredibly strong climbers out there. And AJ was saying that her fingers are far less strong than Allison's, but um, but but they're fast. So how, how do you get to the bottom of that, I guess, um, when a client comes in, whether it's me or a pro, does this all start with the testing? Yeah, so it really depends on like the athlete. And you can, um, so as an example, like the, something called the strength to weight ratio, right? Everyone that is listening is probably familiar with that number. I think AJ's was maybe like 1.7 or something, which is like, a, or maybe maybe closer to 1.9, but Allison's was 2.7. Like, mm -hmm. so in terms of the amount of force she can put on her fingers is exponentially greater than 
any other athlete I've seen for that matter. That's bonkers. Yeah, it's, it's outrageously strong. And so if you look at like, but it, but even though they kind of maybe look the same because they're both kind of tall and slender and they are both climb, climb really hard, they don't need the same thing because one thing that people maybe don't understand is like being really strong doesn't guarantee your success with a sport. Like if you looked at someone on a campus board, you would assume that because Allison has really strong fingers, campus boarding would be like really easy, really powerful. But because of her leverage, campus boarding is actually really quite slow. Like one of the slowest athletes we've tested on a campus board. And so for her as a counter example, she doesn't, using a campus board is not fast enough to increase her power output. That's a bad training intervention for Allison because it's not making her more powerful. It's actually mm -hmm. just relies on her finger strength and she just does like a one arm pull and then reaches really far. But she's not really increasing her power output in that context. But she, when I tested her at that time, she had been doing a lot of campus boarding because it's kind of one of those things as a climber, especially a professional climber, you hear that campus boarding is good for power, right? But that's relative to the individual athlete, where in some cases, maybe it is, but in her case, probably not. So she would be much better off using her feet on the wall to actually increase her power output. And so they climb very differently because of that as well. So lots of like, you know, pieces to tie together. Yeah, that, that specificity of training, that individualized training, that I feel like is one of the biggest takeaways that we can have here, um, not just the elite climbers, but all of us. And, you know, we get talking about things like um, AJ did, talking about kind of junk training or just training well beyond the point at which you're getting the output that you should. Um, let's take a listen, actually, to, to what she had to say about that. And so the thing that's trained the most for me is that in having my training become way more specific, I'm just doing significantly less hmm. and still seeing more gains. So everything is just so precise and, and specific and like exactly the amount I need to do, exactly the weight I need to do, exactly the reps sets I need to do to like see those gains and not like not a minute more. And so I'm not like crawling out of the gym. So how common is that, Tyler, for, for athletes at any level, elite to weekend warriors to be essentially training beyond the point at which they're getting a benefit? Yeah, that's absolutely kind of the most valuable thing that an athlete can learn about their training is if your training interventions, if your non-climbing training is negatively influencing your climbing, then you're probably not doing it correctly, right? There's there's in some cases a good excuse to be overly sore or really fatigued from certain days of training, but that shouldn't be the average training session mm -hmm. because typical strength and power sessions should be pretty easy to recover from. It's really the lower intensity, longer duration training sessions that are the hardest to recover from. So when athletes go to the gym with the primary objective of getting wasted, like that's a dangerous habit to get into simply because it's hard to break that habit, which was definitely my habit when I was in my 20s in college, but it's also hard to recover from. So it definitely increases your risk of getting injured, but it also kind of messes with your muscle fibers. And so the ones, especially for AJ, that's mostly bouldering, like she needs to be as strong and powerful as she can. If she spends too much time getting really fatigued at the gym, what she's doing is she's essentially taking down the ability of those bigger muscle fibers to produce force very quickly, which is very counterproductive for bouldering. Can we for a second just contrast two different climbing styles then and see what amount of load or, or fatigue you feel kind of in a general sense, of course, would be appropriate. So taking a look at a, a boulderer, right, like we've been talking about with AJ, but then somebody like myself, I climb predominantly these long pumpy sport routes at the Red River Gorge. So you know, how do you look at training through those two different styles of climbing? Yeah, bouldering is very different than Red River Gorge sport climbing. The edges are different. The power output is different. The angle of the wall, the distance, like all of those things are so different. Um, it's really hard to say, you know, for individuals over training and under training, but we can say that training for the Red River Gorge absolutely is more fatiguing than is training for bouldering. So the two dramatic examples, I guess, would be 
red point bouldering training or doing some sort of capacity training on steep terrain, if that's the train the Red River Gorge of the project you're working on, like the, that second example would give you much more fatigue. You would do fewer of those sessions through the week than you would if you were doing, you know, red point or limit style bouldering just because it's harder to recover from. You write quite a bit, um, you like on your Instagram, you've done some some great interviews with regard to injury and climbing specific injuries, pulley ruptures and, and this kind of thing. And it sounds like by and large, those occur not from some limit move that explodes the finger, but essentially uh, the cumulative effect of submaximal volume. Is that is that a correct kind of recap of that? Or? Yeah, for sure. It's it's There's always the off chance that you do have uh, one acute mechanism that has enough force and rotational stress and torque that you could have an acute injury, but by and large, the research would suggest that even with youth climbing injuries, it's really the slow accumulation of stress over time. And that's essentially, you know, having a session that you don't recover from, having another session, don't recover from, have another session. Those things just kind of snowball. And, you know, your body's ability to tolerate that stress, something's going to give at some point. And because of the stress we put on our fingers, finger annular pulleys are incredibly strong. So it's, it's really like the idea that that slow, continuous behavior of beating yourself up, that's the most risky thing you could do as an athlete. And that applies for every sport, right? Not just climbing, but I always kind of look at my programming and my, you know, thoughts about training through the lens of not getting injured because that's mostly what I do is talk with people that are injured. But I hear the same story over and over and over, right? So it's really kind of educating people about that. Yeah, injury prevention really does seem to be the name of the game. But of course, you know, from time to time, people do get injured, whether it's elite climbers or weekend warriors. Um, you know, oftentimes, like you say, it might just be this this accumulation that that leads to an acute event or what we perceive was an acute event. And I think Kevin Jorgensen from this past season, you know, spoke about that. He's climbed hard his whole life, never had a major finger injury, and then um, was training or maybe overtraining, I think he said, and didn't get a proper warm up, And it led to this pretty significant finger injury. And then he took time off, a few months off. And then when he was starting to get back into climb again, that's where some of the struggle really occurred. Let, let's hear what he had to say about that. But as soon as Tom told me like, hey, it's not supposed to be pain-free. If it's a two or a three out of 10, it's okay. That's normal for coming back on this kind of thing. So Kevin was talking about working with his uh, coach there, Tom Randall, um, over at Lattice, and essentially, you know, trying to find a comfort level of returning, even though it wasn't pain-free. So I guess first, let's just look at injuries in general, these finger injuries in general, and then what you prescribe to your athletes um, for, for when they are ready to come back. Yeah, so it depends on when. Um... You know, I speak with them in relation to when they had the injury. In his example, you know, he obviously had a diagnosed by MRI and had the splint on and did all the things necessary and then was cleared to load. And so at that point, he was totally all cleared to load. Then it's kind of, you know, building the confidence back in the finger, um, which I think is really important um, and kind of individual for each athlete, right? But having some guidance there is really important. And there's a couple of things that I thought about when listening to that episode where well, I think he mentioned he was like four days on, right? And so four days on in a row, you know, kind of like kind of a red flag. That's a lot of loading, right? And uh, everyone does that. And he's probably done that a thousand times and gotten away with it. But the other thing that to think about in that context is he had introduced a new type of stress. And so one of the things when it comes to this general idea that everyone needs to do a certain thing on a fingerboard kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. It's really about like what your tissues are used to doing and any dramatic change in that, either more stuff or less stuff could be considered a risk factor for getting injured. So where do you draw the line there on bringing in something novel so that, you know, like you hit a plateau because I've been doing the same 7-3 repeater for a year or something like that and saying, okay, I'm going to shake it up and try something new, smaller edge, bigger edge with more weight, that kind of thing. Perfect. I would say if someone's already doing some sort of repeater protocol and they're regularly loading a fingerboard on a fingerboard, 
two or three times per week or before they're climbing, et cetera. And they change that protocol, different edge, maybe add a little more weight, maybe change the work to risk ratio. I would say that probably is not significant and or really that different of an intervention. But for someone that's never used a fingerboard and mostly spends their time climbing outside, introducing weighted hangboarding to me would be something considered shining a new. All right. So that makes sense. And, and now in Kevin's case, of course, the injury happened. He took the prescribed rest time. He was cleared to come back. And then, of course, was experiencing some apprehension of pulling down hard, which is totally understandable. How do you work with your clients when that happens? Ultimately, the, the more chronic the injury, the less likely it is the tissue causing the sensitivity, which means that, you know, after three months of rest, it's really just like, I don't know about getting on the wall. It sounds like a bad idea. That's mostly fear generated. Mm -hmm. Another analogy I like to give athletes is if you, if you have one pulley rupture and you wear a splint for even, let's say, three weeks of time, when you load four fingers at the same time on both hands, you're still loading way more healthy tissue than you are injured tissue. Mm -hmm. And if you're loading in an open-handed position, you're not bending the PIP joint to 90 degrees, that's not that much stress on the A2 pulley. And so if we're consistently loading, I'm a bigger fan of loading people on the wall in conjunction with wearing the pulley splint simply to minimize that hesitation for when can I load my fingers, right? I like to keep that in their program relatively soon, probably sooner than most people, simply because, you know, we, we can mitigate how much load we put on that tissue, but we're still keeping them, you know, um, keeping their psychological self you know, as if they were their, you know, normal climbing athletes. It's hard to take someone out of their sport completely. Like you mentioned, it's stressful. It's really hard to not do anything for a couple months. It's a big deal. Great. Love it. I think for injuries, that makes a lot of sense. And of course, um, if, if any of us do get injured, um, you've got so many resources on your Instagram. We could also book a, a session with you. But let's shift back to finger strength, which, um, you know, we're all trying to build because... We all understand that that's pretty critical to our climbing, regardless of the style of climber that we are. And, you know, I found it really interesting in Alex Honnold's um, interview, his comments were, were that his struggle in effect was finger strength relative to his peers. Let's listen to what he had to say here. By pretty much any metric of finger strength, I underperform uh, relative to my peers which I manage with, you know, good technique, good footwork, everything else, basically like good execution. I would say I'm a pretty good climber in general, but I'm not that strong of a climber, certainly not relative to the level at which I climb. Look, obviously Alex Honnold has crazy strong fingers compared to most of us, but, you know, his point is interesting, but what did you think of that? When it comes to Alex, like, I have no doubt in my mind that he will be able to climb 515. And really it comes down to like, just has a minute focus. And so if you look at him compared to John Segris is all about pushing himself and his personal limits. Even though everyone outside of climbing is blown away by what Alex Honnold does, for Alex Honnold, that's probably 75% intensity of what his real potential is. But it doesn't seem to me, at least, and I don't know him, that he's really tried to push his single pitch, you know, um, level of like sports performance where his big objectives are mind-blowing how good they are, right? And so that's another volume thing too. He spends the majority of his time climbing at 75%. He does a ton of it or 80% even, right? But until he's willing to really back off all of that volume and spend most of his time doing single pitches at his limit, he won't get there. But it'll be really easy to do when he wants to, right? Because he has such a good skill development. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, you know, admittedly, he just isn't that focused on it. He's been getting more focused on it, climbing more of those really hard sport routes like at Potosi, but he just loves climbing. Actually, here's what he had to say about that. I mean, part of the problem for me is that I climb full time. And so, you know, anytime you do a training program, it's generally focused around the training. So you basically rest for your training days. And, and if you're trying to train finger strength, you basically should be rested for your finger strength sessions. So you basically should be prioritizing your whole life to revolve around hangboard sessions, uh, which for me is just not, it's just not acceptable, basically. Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm willing to hangboard, I'm willing to work hard as a climber, I'm willing to do all the training, but it's like, realistically, I want to climb more than I want to hangboard. 
So, you know, I think that's interesting for all of us. You know, I'm like a super busy dad with a couple of jobs and, you know, I want to get out and climb and have fun, but I also want to get stronger. And so I think, you know, it's interesting to hear from one of the greatest rock climbers in the world with, with Alex Honnold there saying that he just wants to go out and climb. Of course, he also wants to get stronger. And so how do we find that balance? How do you recommend that to your clients, essentially striking this balance between training hard, following the data, getting out and climbing, you know, and figuring out also just what works for you and, and for your life? That's a hard thing to do. Um, but I usually, you know, just try and try and keep it really simple for athletes where if if the if the training that they're doing is making it more stressful and they're either, you know, not performing like they think they can, I would say get rid of the training in a lot of cases. I have a lot of professional athletes that come test with me looking for the shiniest new finger training protocol. And I'd tell them to spend more time climbing on the wall on small holds and just spend more time on the wall climbing because to take an athlete that's used to spending most of their time climbing and tell them to not climb doesn't really work. They're not going to follow through with the training program. Yeah. And as they say, the best training plan is the one you'll actually do, right? So, you know, once we find something that's working for us and there are fantastic resources out there and training's going well, climbing's going well, but inevitably we'll hit plateaus. Um, you know, I've, I've hit them in my career. You know, everybody talks about kind of hitting this plateau. Are there plateaus that you see that are common? You know, like, is there, are there certain grades at which you often hear from climbers where they're like, oh man, I need to push through this? Like, it seems like 512, mid 512, 512 plus is for sure plateau grade. Also seems like V6, V7, also plateau grade, right? And in those cases, those are the people that plateau. Most people will climb to 512 plus or V7 and they'll plateau. And that's when they are like, okay, I need to make my fingers stronger. That's something that I think, you know, I see quite often and I'm sure other coaches do. And that's when simply adding in some more intentional finger loading, we can even say that over finger boarding, they'll hit overcome that plateau. And that's another, I see it as another habit forming thing where spending too much time climbing in a gym can kind of keep that upper level kind of plateaued for longer because you kind of get kind of stuck in the rut of doing the same thing all the time at the gym, which is really easy to do. And I did that for, geez, 10 years of my life, just climbing the same grade at the gym until someone, you know, was like, let's try this. And you're like, oh, I can't climb that. And then they climb that and you know, you can climb like them. You're like, wow, I'm climbing two grades harder too. So it's really easy to get kind of trapped in your, in your own head too about it. Yeah, that's a really good perspective as well as to, to look at gym climbing because, you know, so many of us climb more in the gym than we do outside. And so I can see that. I can see falling into that rut, just going in and working the same grades over and over again. Um, but, you know, essentially a plateau is a plateau wherever you're at. So being mindful of that and working to change things up to push ourselves out of that, whether we're outside or inside, um, is really good advice. So Tyler, now let's shift. Um, and I kind of want to look big picture again now and apply it to us humans, us, us normal climbers. Um, and you started this conversation by saying that what struck you was that a lot of these elite climbers learned the hard way. Um, they did something and it wasn't working. And so then they learned a lesson. Now, my question for you is psychological, I guess, maybe more than practical, but is there any other way for us climbers to learn? I don't know, man. I, I wish that I, you know, that I love, I forget who sings the song, but you know, I wish that I knew now, you know, what I know now when I was younger. Like, I think that's pretty kind of a typical, like, that's just how it goes, right? But hopefully with social media and more access to stuff, I mean, when I started climbing, I knew nothing about rock climbing. I lived in a small town of Colorado and bought a pair of climbing shoes and would look at these magazines and be like, I'd probably be good at that. Like, I have a lot of upper body strength. And so I just started climbing, but there was no like, you know, real way that I could find out information. So hopefully with all the information, people are working so hard to provide. People do kind of maybe shortcut all that struggle. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think I've learned a lot just from following people like yourself and Eric Hurst and Hazel Finlay and Caitlin Holmes, the, the people that were featuring during these expert analysis episodes here, as well as all the pros out there, you know, there's certainly every opportunity for us to maybe learn the easy way instead of the hard way. And so now shifting our focus to 
the weekend warriors, the amateurs, the everyday climbers, most of the people who are listening right now, is there anything, when you're looking back on these 10 episodes, that the pros didn't mention that they struggle with uh, in the area of training that is more common for those of us who are not at that elite level uh, to, in fact, struggle with? Maybe having confidence in themselves. Certainly when it comes to outdoor climbing, you know, the, the, the real way to send hard routes outside, whether it's bouldering or sport climbing is spend a lot of time climbing outside. And so for someone like yourself and myself, like, you know, I don't have multiple hours, multiple days per week where I'm uninterrupted and I can just like focus on climbing. And so that's kind of a hard thing. It's hard to do all your work in the gym and expect huge returns outside when you're not spending a lot of time outside. So that's why we want to really distill that down. But I would say that's probably the biggest, the biggest barrier, you know, and just the time to train, you know, most of most, you know, people in climbing gyms have full-time jobs or they have kids and you're, you know, but I always tell, you know, individuals that think that it's easy to be a pro climber. That's definitely not the case because they have the hardest job, right? It seems seems so great to have all this extra time that you would it would guarantee you to send and they they run into the same plateaus as your show demonstrates that everyone else does maybe they're higher plateaus but they still run into plateaus and because they have all the extra time they got to find a way to fill that time too where i think it was maybe Megos who talks about he's got to find something to do because climbing i think you said 27 days in a row is not sustainable right he's going to get hurt and so that's also a big challenge, you know, on, on their end as well. So I think, you know, just like time management maybe is a good way to sum that one. Yeah, time management's interesting because I think uh, it's like two two opposite sides of the coin here, right? The pros may have too much time on their hands and need to hold themselves back from overtraining, whereas, you know, people like myself and yourself and, and so many others who aren't professional climbers maybe have too little time on our hands to train. And so we either try to pack it all in or we're just burning the candle at both ends. I know that's, you know, often the case for me. And so it's such a relief to hear in this conversation that, you know, training smarter, not harder, less is more, really getting more out of less time. In fact, that's that's going to help in the time management for me. But rest is something that really um, came up a lot. And I asked every athlete what their concept of rest was. And that was another huge through line that I that I saw, which was all of them took rest very, very seriously, at least after maybe learning the hard way, like in the case of Alex Magos. But but everybody, whether it was getting enough sleep, getting enough rest on their off days, um, doing, you know, true rest days where they're literally not doing anything, including like not even like running or yoga. So... I feel like the the pros might take rest more seriously than us amateurs, which is interesting. And I'd like to know how you prescribe the concept of rest and work with your clients on that. Yeah, I usually have athletes try and track. Well, a lot of my clients that have pain complaints, we have them kind of track their pain scores or their sensitivity on a regular kind of routine cycle. For a lot of my individual like athletes that are not rehabilitation clients, I have them try and keep some sort of track of, you know, the difficulty of the sessions and how that's changing over time. You know, one simple example is if if you did the same exact workout every day for a month, it wouldn't feel the same difficulty every day. But you want to pay attention to the how that feels on your system. If mm -hmm. it's feeling more difficult and you're not making it more difficult, something is up. You're not recovering very well, right? If it's feeling easier and you're not making it easier, you're probably adapting in a positive way. So we can say the trend line for both of those scenarios, one goes up, you're like probably a risk of getting injured because your perception of the effort or your perception of the workout is it's getting harder, even though it's not. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a direction that would lead someone to get an injury, but the opposite is how someone would gain an adaptation from it. And so just paying attention to that, because as a coach, you can provide suggestions for people. But like I always tell my clients, I don't really know exactly how you're going to respond. I have a pretty good idea of how I assume you'll respond, but I might be wrong. So I want them to be more aware that they have more decision making and what we do than just me telling them what to do. And, and how much of that then is listening to our bodies and just 
trying to create some stimulus um, without overstressing our, our bodies? And how much of it is it is sticking to a plan? You know, having, I mean, I love to nerd out over my plans, but then I, I, you know, I'll get to the point where it's like, oh man, it's Friday and I haven't done this really hardcore, you know, workout and I've got to do it. And so I'll do it because I want to check that thing off my list, but maybe my body's not ready for it. So I guess, you know, how, how much is it where we're following data and plan and structure versus how much we're following our body or just doing kind of what we can in the moment? Um, I think I think maybe it makes it both. I like the getting really scientific for the individual and maybe giving them direction. You know, this is the general direction that you're going to go. You do want to get stronger and you need to have a consistent routine that provides this type of stimulus, but you want to do it all the time. You need to change it periodically as well. Or another athlete that's like, you don't need to get stronger. You need to get more powerful, right? And so that athlete mm -hmm. would do something a little bit different. They would use less intensity, but they would focus on rate. But you want to do it all the time. Because the reality is, is as your training age grows, your ability to like lose the things that you're good at will never go away. Hmm, what, what do you mean by that? Like for myself, as an example, like I mentioned, I was a Greco-Roman wrestler as a kid. Naturally, I have really good leverage and I have short arms and my genetics means I get big muscles. So I always have been really strong in my upper body. That will never go away. I could sit on the couch for a month and I could still get up and do one arm pull up, right? And so mm -hmm. that's not really that, like there's something special and unique about my training. It's really just like, that's how I'm built. And so the things that people are really good at are never going to go away as long as they're still being physically active, as long as they're still climbing. And so... If we want to get too, we can be too neurotic with the dialing knob of how much and how little of the intensity is, but we can say pretty confidently that one day means very little in your training life. And so if my habit is to suck it up and suffer every time I go to the gym, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You're much better off recovering better and then actually having a better and more intentional workout because the skills that you learn from that workout, especially on the climbing wall, they're affected and could be negatively influenced by the fatigue that you drag from your fingerboarding workout too. Yeah, man, one day means very little in your training life. That's, um, I feel like I'm gonna, you know, write that on a sticky note and, and stick it to my hangboard so that um, it's a reminder to not push it, to not push it when I'm not feeling great. And that makes me think about um, Alex Johnson again, because she was talking about her workouts and she would say that if she wasn't getting 100% output, she would quit. Um, and this was at your direction, and I think Gabe, her her other coach uh, on this, where essentially she used to just power through these workouts because she knew that's what she was supposed to do. But now it's like as soon as the power output fell off, she would quit without some sort of measuring device, without a coach sitting next to us. How equipped are we as average climbers to really be able to to know that, to sense in our bodies, oh, I'm 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 feeling the power or the efficiency or the benefit of this exercise falling off, I'm just going to walk away from it, even though I'm supposed to do four more reps. I think people are really good at measuring it. And you can, mm. and you can, like, I've, I've done that a lot with, I did that on the client this morning who was here for the IFSC comp, but she hasn't really done much of a training program ever, but she's climbing at that high of a level. But when you actually watch someone do pull-ups and we were having her do pull-ups and measuring her velocity, and she could tell, I said, did you, did you tell when your velocity dropped? She said, yeah, the fourth rep, and we did six reps, the fourth rep felt like my power went down. And it literally went down from like 0.8 meters per second to 0.6. Hmm. And so, you know, maybe she's more in tune with her body as a pro athlete, but in general, people know when their performance goes down a little bit. And if it's climbing and you're in the middle of a route, don't pay attention to it. You want to keep trying. But if it's in the middle of a training set, you want to stop, right? And you don't need those tools necessarily to validate that or understand that. They're really helpful for teaching, for educating people. But people now, right, we got to like be more confident in ourselves and our ability to understand, you know, how much we need to adapt, right? And people, people are more knowledgeable about that than they think that they are. That's one thing that I for sure have learned with the testing is people know what to do. We just don't do it. Yeah, well, I, I feel like there's probably a deeper psychology at play here, like with the dopamine reward centers in our brain, where we just love to check off uh, things from our to-do list, you know, things from our workout. And 
you know, is there, um, maybe there's a practical example you can give where climbers are working out in a way or at a length that becomes as a general rule, um, like diminishing returns and, and, and how could we program differently to avoid that? Maybe one like easy example I give people is I'll, I'll talk to them and lots of people that will do four training sessions per week that are like three hours in length, you know, with, from my experience, unless you're, you know, being really thoughtful of how you organize that session, three hours is really long. Everything yeah. beyond two hours is probably suboptimal learning and your nervous system's tired and all that. But I usually say you can just chop your workout in half and do one in the morning and one at night. Then you could train more often. So your four three-hour sessions turns into eight 90-minute sessions or 80-minute sessions. Those shorter sessions are just easier to recover from. So one of the simplest recommendations that you know we can make for climbers is just in general, your average session should be shorter than you think. Like, and just leave when you're not exhausted, like leave before you're tired and it will pay dividends in the long run. But that's a really hard behavior to teach because it's so fun to hang out and try hard. Yeah, climbers love to try. We just love to try hard. Um, but I guess maybe we need to start thinking about trying hard uh, at trying less hard or trying hard to quit sooner. Um, I'm going to try that. And I appreciate you really shining a light on that. Um, it's kind of refreshing, refreshing to talk to somebody who's an expert in training and saying, hey, maybe we need to train a little bit less or a little less hard. So um, thank you for that, Tyler. You know, one more thing that I just want to touch on before we start to wrap up this conversation, and that's a, a post that you had on Instagram not too long ago was called the Pyramid Scheme. And uh, essentially it was looking at like, you know, we're constantly trying to push our grade higher and higher and higher. And maybe to do that is to build this massive pyramid. And so I'd like to get your perspective on training through that lens of pushing the top end grade and, and what you've seen. I was mostly just thinking of like my experience too and my friend who I've mentioned here um, already is, you know, we just kind of get in this idea that this is the grade that we climb and continually climbing this grade will somehow magically let us climb a harder grade. But until we actually spend the time, ma the majority of our time trying to climb that harder grade, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, because the skills aren't the same. You know, the skills of climbing V8 and V6 aren't identical. They might be the same movements, but it's not going to be the same thing. And so if we spend too much time developing skills at a lower intensity, we shouldn't really expect them to, you know, transfer to something that's a higher intensity. So the real intention there was to say, you know, don't waste all your time just worrying about building your base. At some point, you got to try hard. At some point, you need to stop being so tired from doing all the base building and spend that energy trying harder things. Tyler, this has just been awesome, man. Just a, a real masterclass in training as we've looked back at these 10 elite climbers. And before we go, I'd like to hear what you're passionate about beyond your own personal climbing. And, you know, clearly you've got this incredible business going. You're getting to work with some great, great athletes. So, you know, let's talk about Camp for Human Performance and all the work and the passion that you're putting into bringing education to climbers of all levels uh, from all over the world. I'm I'm pretty psyched on like the education side of climbing. I really like, you know, being a um, hopefully a useful avenue for climbing coaches that maybe didn't get, you know, extra eight years of college and a whole lot of debt like I did, you know, information that they can apply into the sport and be confident about their recommendations and, you know, hopefully elevate the sport entirely by understanding some of those things. So... One of the projects I've been working on with my other two coaches, Game and Colin, is developing some sort of education pathway for coaches that they can kind of demonstrate their skills and learn a lot about exercise science. So that's something that we've been working on over the last year that hopefully will be available in the next year or so. Um, but I do a good amount of traveling and teaching, which I really like doing. I, it's fun to meet people in the climate community and share ideas. And, you know, I learn a lot from coaches around that I talk to as well, which is really motivating for me because as I mentioned, it's, I don't, you don't get to stop learning when you're out of school and like having people being interested and supportive really keeps me like motivated to continue learning. So we all can kind of move up together, so to speak. Um, 
But the majority of my life is either, you know, doing research, talking on, or reading research, talking on Zoom calls or testing or playing the guitar, playing with my kids. That sounds like a pretty good life and some rock climbing in there as well. Yeah, 40. definitely not a bad life. I'm, I'm really grateful. I really love my job and it's really quite fun. And I, you know, but for, as you know, like for me, my life is not about me right now. It's about my kids and my family. And then it's about, you know, my job and all the other climbers. So I joke with people that I live vicariously through my clients and their sins because I don't have as much dedicated time that I would like for myself, which is okay with me. I'm like, okay with that in my life. Well, we as a community are just so grateful that you have um, put so much towards educating all of us. You put incredible content out. Um, people can find your stuff, of course, on Instagram. You've got a great YouTube and we, they can book consultations with you right through your website. So um, y'all, if you're interested, you know, pop over to Tyler's um, page there and you can work with him and the team there directly. Tyler, this has been awesome. I want to do it again. And um, thank you, man. Thank you for bringing your expertise to the Struggle Climbing Show and looking back at this 10 episodes from season one here. I gained so much from it and I look forward to talking again. Yeah, you're welcome. Happy to help, man. Thanks for having me a part of it. All right, that wraps up our chat with Dr. Tyler Nelson from Camp 4 Human Performance. What'd you guys think of his analysis? Do you have any questions, any comments? Let us know. You can find us on Instagram at C4HP at Ryan Devlin Outside, and at The Struggle Climbing Show. You know, my big takeaways from this look back on season one through the lens of training are one, pros struggle with training just like the rest of us, whether it's weak fingers or unfocused junk mileage. You know, it just seems like we all learn the hard way on at least one thing or another, but we can fix that, which is great. And, and two, you know, Tyler, as one of the foremost experts on climbing training, He's telling me to train less, and so I think I need to listen to that. Whether it's just breaking my longer sessions into more frequent, shorter sessions, or learning how to quit when I feel powered down, or just simply focusing on the few things that I need to do so that I can have more time to get out on real rock and work the technique and everything else that goes into climbing, I think we can all benefit from seeing how we can train smarter, not harder. And, of course, the good news is that we don't have to figure it out on our own if we don't want to. You guys can book a session with Tyler, whether it's in person or remotely, to dial in exactly what is needed for you. So pop on over to camp4humanperformance.com. That's with the number four, camp4humanperformance.com, and set up a consult. Quick shout out to our friends over at Fizzy Vantage for being the official climbing nutrition sponsor of The Struggle. If you all want to level up your training and performance, check it out. Try their supercharged collagen. Keep your fingers healthy and strong so that you can train harder and perform at your best. Fizzy Vantage is now available in Europe on the Epic TV online shop and in the U.S. at select gyms and, of course, at fizzyvantage.com. Hit that link in your show notes or use code STRUGGLE15 at checkout for 15% off. All right, that clips the anchors on this episode, and I hope you appreciated the work that was put into it by grabbing all those interview clips from the season and looking back in that way with Tyler. If you did appreciate it and you're in a position to support me and the climbers who make these shows, pop on over to patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show and come on aboard as a patron. Or if you can't do that, but you still want a free sticker, we got you. Simply rate and review the show, post a grab of that review to Instagram and tag at the struggle climbing show, and we will slide into your DMs to get your address. Slap it on your stick clip, your Nalgene, your van, or your forehead so that everyone knows that you love the struggle and the struggle loves you. I'm your host, Ryan Devlin, and the show is produced by myself and Mary Mathis with podcast support from Emily Holland. All right, let's climb hard and do good things in the world.